And this point I want to introduce our speaker. David Burke, back back to you guys, and speaker, teacher, and life coach, and best-selling author for over 25 years. He's a former Nordstrom store manager, and has managed the corporate world for over 30 years. His published works include the Burger's Daily Gratitude Journal, Happy Starts with Gratitude, and a number of other books on gratitude. He recently shared the stage with Bill Gates Sr. at the regional conference, and is currently conducting keynotes and workshops for Special Olympics, Children's Hospital, the SHS, and our new U.S. military in the community. As a result of his passion for gratitude, he has presented over 250 speeches and workshops in the past three years, with over 650 gratitude videos posted on YouTube, thousands of his message, and he's now considered a leading authority on gratitude and how living a life of gratitude can enhance and improve your life. He resides in Issaquah, Washington. Please join me in welcoming our best speaker today, David Burke. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you Nate. Hold on. Thank you, Nathan. June 20th, 1968. I'm sitting in the Seattle Center Arena. I get a little rolled piece of paper, my diploma. They put it like this, they gave it to us, and out I walked to my car, and I had this big plan for my life, all planned out. Well, I was the same age as most of you are here today, back then in 68. Well, the plan that I got didn't quite work out the one that I thought I was going to get. And I thought about the fact that I think your success in life, and Nathan just mentioned, I'm going to talk a lot about gratitude today, but also what direction you want to go for your careers. You young ladies and gentlemen may have five and six careers compared to my generation and my parents' generation that maybe had one. It's always about finding the passion, and that's what I talk a lot about. And one of the things I mentioned is a tool in that whole situation is gratitude. But I think your success in life is going to be determined by how you dealt with the plan you got versus the one you thought you were going to get. And I will tell you that it's my experience that this is life. If I had a whiteboard, I'd take the chalk and go like this. I've never met anybody where it was all up or all down. It's this whole series of ups and downs. When you're up here, it's really fantastic. When you're down here, it kind of sucks. When you're up here, everybody has your phone number. When you're down here, nobody seems to have it or call. I always notice that. But down here is where you learn all the lessons. I visited a friend of mine yesterday in Union Gap. I came over last night. I usually like to get early at talks I'm doing because I don't like to freak out with I live in Seattle with a past or what have you. And I, I visited him in a rest home. Well, I'd done a lot of nursing homes and rest homes in the past, and I thought, what a great opportunity to talk to these people that the average age was 85 to 90, 95, and ask them, what do you know now that you would like to have known at 17 or 18? And some of the answers are phenomenal. And I usually memorize everything that I talk about, but this was something that was just really interesting. It's never too late. You'll find out how I started very late in my life to become a speaker. Just be happy for yourself. Be teachable. Seek out a mentor. I had many mentors, mentors that helped me in school, in life, in speaking, in doing books, and all these different types of things. And then you become a mentor. One of the most rewarding things you can do. I always have a plan B. I didn't always have a plan B. A lot of times I had just a plan A, and I said, well, it's going to work. This was one of my favorites. Don't party as much. <laughs> I like this one. Be present. Life flies by. Boy, my life has flown by. Set goals. Make constant course corrections. I'm blessed enough to be a pilot. I flew for a lot of years. I still fly occasionally. I landed at this airport over here a number of times. When you fly from Seattle to Yakima, you're never flying straight. You're always a little zigzag because of wind and conditions and heat and all this type of thing. So you're always making minor course corrections. When you get a problem, receive it like a gift. I love that one. Never stop being a student. I'm a student. You folks are all students. We're all students. If you just pay attention to learn the lessons. You will fail. It is part of the process. A lot of talks I do, depending on how much time I have, I don't go into a lot of detail on things, but when I was 32 years old, I was worth two and a half million dollars. Had my own airplane, had a fancy Jaguar, big fancy house in Seattle. 
flying over to Yakima, as I mentioned, by 35, I had that much. I just blew it all. And the funny thing is, is you know what I did? I over-leveraged. And friends of mine would say, you know, nobody's going to buy that story, Dave. Why don't you just tell them you got hooked on cocaine? It'd be a lot easier to stomach. Any case, any case, that taught me a huge lesson. And the lesson that taught me is money does not solve your problems. It helps, but it's not the answer. But what I found is that you're going to have to get grateful at some point in your life because it gives you a better way to live. How many people here have suffered a significant personal loss in your life? Now that's half the hands. You can imagine in the nursing homes, it's everybody. But high schools where I get to do talks like this, commencement speeches or whatever, it's always half, which just blows my mind where the average age is 17 or 18 or 19. Very quickly, September 29th, 1998, it was a Tuesday. I woke up, I went, where's my wife? Where's Dana? She's not in bed. This is strange. I get out, just as I get out, Connor, my four-year-old, comes up, where's mom? I don't know. Let's go find her. So we walk out into the hallway. Kyle, my 14-year-old, same question, we don't know. So we start looking in a few rooms, we walk down to the end of the hall, we look downstairs, and there she is, <clears throat> excuse me, there she is in front of the washer and dryer, crumpled over, it doesn't look good. We run down there, I turn her over, I do mouth to mouth, I do chest compressions. I said, Connor, here, help me. Kyle, call the police, call fire. And in about five to 10 minutes, 25 people were in our house. And they were working on those paddles and they had the tubes and the wires and all this kind of thing. Extremely surreal. So with those of you that may have gone through something like that in this room will know one thing. When something like that happens, time has no measure. I didn't know how much time had gone by and this little fire person comes over to me and says, Mr. Brook, we've been working on your wife for an hour and a half. We still don't have a heartbeat. Do you want us to continue? And even when you're in shock, your body kind of shuts down, but the brain still seems to work. And I went 90 minutes, no heartbeat. I looked at the nice little young lady and I said, no, you can stop. And she was dead. And she was 38. Kyle was 14, Connor was four. I had a whole bunch of other bad things happen to me. My father committed suicide. My mom died of cancer when I was young. And at some point, I decided I'm going to have to figure out a lot of this comes back to how you look at life, how you view life. So I'd like everybody to stand up if you'd be so kind. And actually, I see a clock here, which no offense to your generation, but people don't even know what clockwise is anymore. So I have to like point to it and go, it's like this direction. So put your right hand up and just turn it in the clockwise direction. There's the clock if you need it. Just stretch it out. Feels good this time of morning. And then as you do it clockwise, Start bringing your hands slowly down, down to the top of your forehead, your eyes, your chin, your chest, and your waist. Now what direction is it going? Who said that? Very good. It's going counterclockwise. You can sit down. You notice that too? There's always a few people going like this, like what just happened? I met you last time. Yeah. Probably had the answer last time. You had the answer. You don't get that answer. He goes, I've heard this before. I know the answer to that. So if we had a glass of water, I would say to you, is it half full or half empty? I've had all this bad stuff too bad. That's life. You can choose to see it half full or half empty. My father, who took his own life, was very negative. I used to say, good morning, Dad. He'd go, what's good about it? I thought, wow, what an attitude. So as I look at every one of your faces, each one of you has a choice every single day, every single month, every single year, and every career that you have. Are you going to look at it as half full or half empty? And you may change that career. And as Nathan said, it's true. You might try something. You might put some money into it. But maybe that's just an investment for the future when you figure out what you want to do. But you've got to get out there and try. It does depend on how you look at it. I said many times, I've paid a lot of tuition it just hasn't always gone to colleges. But we learn a lot of lessons in life. So I decided I was gonna need something. I used to, when I did these talks a long time ago, I'd go into a lot more detail about all the bad stuff that happened to me, but that's enough. My attitude is, without even knowing some of you, I know a few, but not all of you, of course, whatever's happened to you, you can choose to see how you look at it, clockwise, counterclockwise, half full, half empty. So to me, one of the things I learned is learning about something called gratitude. 
What gratitude does is make you focus on everything you have versus what you don't have. One of the things that I sell a lot of is a gratitude journal. It takes about five minutes every day to write in that gratitude journal for everything you're grateful for. But let me just give you an example. Now I notice there's a thing here that says no cell phones. So would everybody take out your cell phones, please? I know you have them. <laughs> and you're gonna need a partner for this. And there's always, you gotta get a partner who's sitting next to you. And there's always a few people that, can the three of us do it? Whatever, that's, it's a <laughs> partner thing, it's two people. So get a partner and I'll explain to you what we're gonna do. If you don't have a cell phone, you could just play along. I, think, I imagine that's two of you. And so if you know your partner's phone number, you're gonna text them, so get them in your text box. If you don't, ask them their phone number. And for those of you that are ready to go in the text message, I want you to type two words. You, Y-O-U, R, A-R-E. Two words, you are. Don't type anything yet. Just get it in the text message and we'll get ready to go. Christina, no cell phone? Okay, I'm gonna give you 30 seconds and here's what I want you to do. Whether you know this person really well or you've known them for 20 years, you've known them for 20 minutes, I want you to put in your text every word you can to describe them. I see you as, in other words, you are happy, energetic, smart, intelligent, anything like that. Do as many words as you can in 30 seconds, go. And when you're done, hit send. When I tell you 30 seconds. Okay, and stop, so go ahead and sit, hit send. And obviously you should get that message immediately. Huh? What? It's gotta go to outer space. Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> and then take a look at what that person said to you and text you about how you are. And just take 10 seconds to read it. Okay, so hopefully you've all gotten the message by now. So when you saw what that person sent to you, by show of hands, how many people might hold on to that text? About two thirds. So you guys are a pretty good audience. I used to do this with pieces of paper, but you guys are on your smartphone so much that I figure if I can't beat you, join you. And I'm looking down and people are doing this. Hey, how's your talk? I don't know, I'm sending a text right now to a buddy. So we'll just join you. But here's my point. If somebody sees you like that, why do we see ourselves in such a negative light? I went to younger folks than you and I learned not to do it there because they, I used to call it, I see you as, and now I call it you are, and they'd say, I see you as an idiot. And I go, <laughs> that's not the point. The point is, gratitude helps you focus on everything you have and if a friend says, I see you as smart, intelligent, hardworking, energetic, all those things, why do we not view ourselves like that? I've never understood this. Why we will say things to ourselves, we'll never say to a friend. A long time ago, I took a word out of my, vac uh, my vocabulary, L-O-S-E-R. I used to call myself that all the time, but not anymore. Embracing gratitude. That's an example in about two minutes about how much embracing gratitude will give you the framework because I'm going to mention this later on before I wrap up. The most important relationship you'll ever have in your entire life is the one you have with you. And some, some people will say God and the Creator and so forth and I'm fine with that too. But that relationship with that person in the mirror makes such a huge difference. If you're not that person's best friend, it's going to be challenging going through.
Embracing gratitude. The second thing I talk about is it takes as long as it takes. I am 66 years old. Four years ago, I decided to become a speaker. I wanted to be a speaker when I was 19. I went and did a talk at a high school in, in uh, Seattle. I walked to my car and I want to be a speaker someday. 42 years later, I finally did it. Wow. Colonel Sanders, 63, when he started KFC. J.C. Penney, 58. Ray Kroc, 54. Mary Kay Ash, 59. So I decided about four years ago, I have got to stop putting this off. I was managing, I managed this Nordstrom down here. I was talking to Jeff, I guess it's going to be some hotel or something. I managed that back in the early 90s. But worked for Nordstrom for a long time, worked for Lowe's, managing a home improvement store. So on December 27th, I come home four years ago, about two in the afternoon, and Connor, who's now 17 at the time, says, what are you doing home? It's two in the afternoon. I said, I quit. You quit Lowe's? They go, yeah. You quit Lowe's. You quit being a store manager, making quite a bit of money. I said, yeah. Well, what are you going to do? He's sitting on the couch looking at me. I'm going to be a speaker. He looks up at me and he goes, well, that's just super dad. <laughs> he goes, I have a question for you. What are we going to do for food? <laughs> I told him, I said, Connor, if you believe in something, if you're passionate about it enough, it'll happen. I really, really believe, and back to Nathan's comments about some of you are going to get off to the first career you have and it's going to be there for the rest of your life. Some are going to have four or five. But if you have a great relationship with yourself and you find something you're passionate about, I'll talk about that in about 10 or 15 minutes before I wrap up, you will have success. There are so many people that I tell them when I, I do videos every Monday morning, the last four words I say, and if you hear nothing else I say today, remember this, be grateful, never quit. Be grateful, never quit. Connor was 17 when he said that. When he was four, he wanted to play baseball. He kept trying at baseball. He says, Dad, I want to play baseball. So I'm struggling to raise these two boys without my wife, and we had no life insurance because she got hooked on prescription medication and overdosed and died. You know what? You got to move on. You got to put it back, get back on the horse. You got to get back in the race. But Connor played baseball for four or five years, never even played. But he kept trying. Kept, kept trying. 10 years later, he's about 13, 14. We're at a game one day. And I'm always in the stands, but he never plays. Little League. Back in the original stand, back when he started playing, he had the T-ball thing, the T was here, and he couldn't hit, he swing. What the hell are you doing? What the heck are you doing swinging up here? <laughs> the ball's down here. Okay, Dad. And he goes down, he finally gets low enough, he hits the T, the ball dribbles off. He goes, Dad, I got a hit. I think the object's to hit the ball. But he kept trying, he kept trying. So finally we get to this game. They're down seven to six. The bottom of the seventh. He's out of players. And he looks down to the end of the, is there anybody left down there? The guy goes, Brooks down here. So Connor comes out, get him out here, get him up to the plate. So he comes up, he's swinging the bat. He looks at me in the stands and goes, Dad, I'm up. Now what kid ever talks to his parents in the stands? They want you there, but they don't want you to acknowledge that you're there. He gets up, ball one, strike one, ball two, strike two. Full count. Next pitch comes in, he just rips it down the third baseline. He goes inside the bag. The guy from third comes in, because there was a guy in second and third. The guy from second rounds third comes in. Here comes the ball, the guy, the catcher. The catcher catches the ball. They crash to the plate and the ball pops out. And they win eight to seven. And he's standing out in second base, about as far as the back of this auditorium. Dad, I got a hit! What do you think? I used to not be able to tell that story without choking up. The whole entire dugout came out and put them on their shoulders and carried them across the field. That's what's not giving up. I sat down on the couch that night and I said, Connor, it was never about baseball. I have my picture handy. It's in my journal. I said it was about the fact he never gave up. He went on. That was Bothell High School in Seattle, Bothell. He went on to become the leading hitter on the baseball team, and he was student of the year at a 3.5. And I'd had to hold him back in first grade, kindergarten, because he struggled so much after her death. But that's what happens when you don't give up. Embracing gratitude, number one. Number two, don't give up. Never, ever, ever give up. It takes as long as it takes. Every one of your journeys is going to be different. It's your journey. Run your own race. Do not compare yourself to anybody else. That is the thief of joy. 
You want to get rip joy out of your life, start comparing yourself to who has what. But get that connection with the person in the mirror. Something that helped me tremendously, a gratitude journal. I sell them. I don't care if you buy mine or get a wire spiral. You take five minutes every day to write in a gratitude journal. A buddy of mine says, by the way, how many people here have ever heard of a gratitude journal? Wow, more and more people have heard of it. Of course, some of the people more my age, but that's okay. You guys are catching up. Because I, I do these, and you write in it every day. It takes you five minutes. So every time I'm in one of these groups, you know what they say. Excuse me, question back here. Yeah, do you have an app? I go, <laughs> there actually is an app. <laughs> and I go like this. I'm so grateful to Nathan Talbot for inviting me over to Perry in Yakima. And it just types it. You just hit, sit, there it is, and it's on there. Not quite the same, though, as writing it. There have been a number of surveys. I know we're in a school, of course, so this makes sense. A number of surveys that said when you get a thought in your brain and it comes down your arm to your wrist, to your hand, to your pen, to the paper, it's more implanted in your brain when you write it down. So if you want to have an app or you want to just electronically say all the things you're grateful for, that's fine. I will tell you, I don't think books will ever go away and I don't think writing will ever go away. But how this works, there's a little saying at the top that says, if you think about it, it's like a dream. If you talk about it, it inspires you. If you write about it, it empowers you. It makes a huge difference. All this gratitude journal is, is on the left-hand side, you write what you're grateful for. There's the highlight of your day, the day and the date. And on the right-hand side, you write what you're going to be grateful for. What does that mean? You're going to be grateful for. Your subconscious mind that resides in your prefrontal cortex cannot tell the difference between something you think is going to happen and has actually happened. I've been writing for the longest time. I'm so grateful to speak to 100 people, to 1,000 people. Now I've spoken to 10,000 soldiers. So now I write, I'm, I'm just so grateful to be speaking to millions of people. That's how you plan it. Daily number. Get out your smartphones again. So go to your notepad or your uh, memo pad or wherever you can make a few notes. The daily number is simply this, and I'm going to show you how this gratitude journal works. 1 to 10. 10 is the best day of your life. 1 is not a so good day. So I want you to put in the number that you are right this very moment. People are like, oh, you mean like this very second? No, like yesterday at 4 o'clock. I mean, just, just right now. How do you feel? Are you an 8? Are you 8 and a half? You can use halves and just put whatever that number is. Don't show it to anybody. This is just for you. Don't show it to your friends. I see some of you sharing stuff. So whatever that number is, seven, seven and a half, eight, five, nine and a half, whatever, put that number. Okay, now scroll down a line or two, and I want you to write the number one thing you're grateful for in your life. It could be a word, it could be a sentence, a person, anything. And for those of you that are speedy, go to number two and put the second thing you're most grateful for in your life. And lastly, and this requires a little thought sometimes, it's early in the morning, what time is it, 7.40? What was the highlight of your day yesterday? What was the best thing that happened to you yesterday? And write that down after the first two gratitude things. Okay. So you have that number at the top. I want you to silently, do not share this with anybody. This is nobody. I see some of you. I see, I see you two guys right there. <laughs> I see you two. Hey, look at me. God, the speaker's picking on me. This is, I've had people that were like a four or five. I wouldn't want to show that to anybody. I'm having a tough day. That's why it's personal. I want you to reread the three things you said. Number one, number two, and the highlight of your day. And then I want you to put a number below that after you read those three and see if it's changed after reading those three things and put that number down there. Okay, how many people's number stayed the same? Okay, quite a few. How many people's number went up? Thank you, it's been phenomenal being here. This is really, nobody ever laughs at that, and I think that's like so funny. It's like, that's a 30 second example of what embracing gratitude will do for you. Of course, I had a friend say, well, perhaps did you think it's not funny? Maybe you shouldn't say it anymore. I thought, yeah, that's true. That is how quickly, and I have mine that I keep in my briefcase. I've got a blank one here. 
but I'll get into really good detail about this when I do workshops, especially the military. 22 soldiers commit suicide every single day. By the time I'm done talking, another soldier will have taken their life. 122 Americans commit suicide every day. Those are just the stats. Is that negative? Of course it is. But you know what? This is a tool in the toolkit. All I ever talk about is a gratitude journal, exercising, whatever it might be. It's a tool to help you. Because when I talk about up and down, up is great. You're going to all have that. But down is where you need the help. This is something that can help you. And it makes a huge, huge difference. I'll show people my gratitude journal after I do a talk. And I've got all the... I'm, every single day, I already wrote in it early this morning in the hotel where I stayed. And they look at it and they flip... Can I look at it? Sure. They look through it and they go, Wow, you write in this every day. I go, did you hear the talk? Were you like, were you like listening? Or were you on your phone? And you know, it's like, whatever. Find you, find your passion, find your purpose. This may be the most important thing I tell you besides be grateful and never give up. I think it's so important that relationship you have with yourself and I don't understand why we will say things to ourselves we'll never say to a friend as I mentioned earlier. Here's a $20 bill. If I just came out and said to you, you want this $20 bill, how many people would want it? Thank you. <laughs> I love people that do that. It's so great. So if I do this, how many people want it? God, you guys are an active group. I like that. Right, Jason? If I do this, and I smooth it out, how many people want it now? You guys are the best. So much better than Kamiak High School. Just kidding. Lastly, if I look at Andrew Jackson, who's on the 20, and I say to him, listen, Andrew Jackson, you're worthless. I don't even know why you're on this earth. You serve no purpose. I think you're a complete waste of time. You know what Andrew Jackson says? Well, that's just super, Mr. Speaker Man, but I'm still worth 20 bucks. And he would be right. So my question is, why do you let somebody crush you, step on you, tell you you're worthless or don't belong on this earth and devalue you from 20 down to 15 to 10 to 5 to worse yet, zero? It's happened to me. It's happened to a lot of people. Andrew Jackson won't let it happen. I hope you don't either. That's why I go back to that relationship so much. That's finding you, getting connected with you. I want to tell you one other thing, too. If you wonder about how important that relationship is, I go to a Reno with my buddy a couple times a year to gamble. We don't spend a lot of money. We just have fun, see some shows and things. A couple years ago, he puts a quarter in, and I'm sitting over doing some other machine, and the quarters, he wins $1,000 for 25 cents. And they're just raining down. He goes, Brooker, Brooker, Dave, high five. I'm buying dinner. Hey, and I high five him. That's super great. And I just... Wow, that's cool. And I thought, you know, it's really cool. And I thought it'd be just a little cooler if it was me. <laughs> and people are going to say, well, listen to you. But that's the relationship we have with us. I mean, that's part of it. It took me 42 years to realize my passion. I sure hope it doesn't take you folks that long. But if you keep trying, if you keep staying in the race, if you keep never giving up like Connor did in the baseball, and you get a good relationship with yourself, you don't let yourself get devalued, you figure out your passion. How do you figure out your passion? You've heard this before. What if you had a million dollars a day or five million dollars a day deposited in your checking account? What would you do? <laughs> Can we have security? Uh, let me just take this one. <laughs> I have a buddy of mine. He's worth a lot of dollars. I don't know if it was a uh, million dollars, but we're having lunch one day at Salty's in West Seattle. And he writes out on a little piece of paper, David Brook, one million dollars. Michael Hartzell hands it to me. Would you cash this? And I said, sure. Uh, hold one, one second. If you cash this, you have to stop being the gratitude guy effective immediately. And he says, would you do it? And I said, no. million dollars. I took me 45 years to find this. Again, I hope it doesn't take you as long. I will tell you this. 
People come up to me and they cry and they hug me. I have people tell me they're thinking about jumping off a bridge. A lot of things that I get to help people. It's the most gratifying thing I've ever done. Running a Nordstrom store, corporate jet, Seahawks, all that kind of stuff, that was fine. Lowe's, going back to the track back in North Carolina, all this, it was all fine. But nothing can impact you more than you can impact somebody else. Nathan said it, service above self, that's rotary. If you want to help yourself, help other people. It works every single time. Sometimes it might take a little longer, but it works every single time. But I find it so important, because I believe if you find yourself and get a great connection with yourself, write in a gratitude journal for everything you have every single day, put it on a memo, on an app, whatever, will keep you focused on everything you have versus what you don't have. And you will be so much better prepared to take on this career journey that you're on. Once you find that, if you get your passion, and you have to might try a few different things, it took me a long time to be doing this. I think you'll get your purpose in life. Seven or eight or nine out of ten people hate their jobs. It's so sad. There was a uh, friend of mine at Boeing. I still couldn't believe this. They put the little sign on the bulletin board, Joe Jones, the right wing assembly guy, retired. Here's a little notice. And then they have yarn in the, in the, the uh, little bureau or on the desk, I should say. Here'd be the yarn over here. Three months later, obituary. Purpose was gone. So I think it is so incredibly important to see if you can get a connection with yourself, figure out what you're really passionate about, and I think you'll find your purpose. There was a book written years ago, Do What You Love and the Money Will Follow, Marcia Sinclair. Very, very powerful. The book was really great, but the title kind of said it all. Steve Jobs. Any people, anybody here seen the Steve Jobs commencement speech? No, quite a few. I highly recommend it. It's 14 and a half minutes long, and he talks in that speech at Stanford, 2005, about 10, 11 years ago, about first five minutes was on how he was adopted and some of the things that happened to him. The second five was on Apple, and the last five was on beating cancer, which he beat at the time, but then unfortunately later lost his life too. The most important thing he told me in that journey, in that video, is you can connect the dots backwards but not forwards. I can go back now and look at why I met Nathan, where's Jeff, why I met Jeff, why I met Jason yesterday, all those things, and I can, Christine, the president, I gotta make sure, I should have said her first, sorry. <laughs> Why I met Christine, and then Nathan. <laughs> but it all makes sense, but you can't look forward and see where you're gonna go. You can only be where you are now and look back and see why those pieces fit together. Some people believe everything happens for a reason, some don't. I happen to believe it. So, embracing gratitude. It takes as long as it takes, never give up. Get rid of stuff in your brain. Don't let stuff get in your way. Get a gratitude journal and do something every single day that's gonna help you focus on what you have. Find yourself, find your passion, find your purpose. And lastly, one of the best things we can do in this world, and I go back to Rotary, is sharing. Sharing whether it's gratitude or anything else. So, everybody get out your smartphones again. I'm telling you, I started switching over to the cell phone thing here a few years ago because I was just getting defeated. I'd go to people, how many people have been on their smartphones since I've been talking? Like everybody raised their hand. They go, thanks for listening. You know, so I just figured, you know what? I'll just join you guys. And then I come here today and I see no cell phones. I go, oh, that's going to happen. So here's what we're going to do. This is called the four T's, as in the letter T. Text, which is what most people will do. Tell, telephone, or... What's the other one? Tweet. So most people are going to text. I want you to, I'm going to give you a minute. You guys are so fast, so you may be doing more than one. I'm going to give you one minute to text, tweet, telephone, or tell somebody in your world right now how grateful you are to have them in your life. Go.
Okay, and stop. So, I started doing this, I don't know, a year or two ago. And I was actually in an, I was actually in an auditorium about like this, and it was not quite where Nathan is. I could, everybody, most everybody texts. But this person was actually using this as a telephone. It was quite a concept. And I could hear her, and she was over right here. And uh, so this is what I hear. Honey, I, I'm assuming it's her husband. Honey, I just want to tell you I'm so grateful for you. I just love you so much, and I just appreciate everything about you. And I just got, I don't know. Some speaker just told me to call you and tell you. <laughs> I just went, <laughs> went, no, take responsibility. It's not me. You're going to ruin the whole thing. So then, afterwards, I sell my books, and, I, and you can sign up for a video. I send out a two-minute video every Monday morning. If you want it, you can sign up for it. I've got my business cards. There's a QR code that takes you right to the website. So people come over and they show me their text. You know, hey, look at this one. And so this one comes up and it says, I'm grateful for you too. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, what was the other one? Uh, oh, I know. Are you sure you sent this to the right person? <laughs> But the part of that that gets me is that whether you're into that relationship and understanding how important the relationship you have with the person in the mirror or it's somebody in your life that says, I'm grateful for you too, what do you want? It's like, do we say it enough? Do we do it enough? If somebody says, you're so smart, you're so nice, you're so, I'd love to see some of those texts too that you're going to hopefully save. You're so bright, you're so energetic, you're so funny. Do we ever say that enough? Can somebody say that to you and then you, you've said that too many times. You've said it too many times, please. And the thing that I just did on the phones, I normally like when I was at Sunrise Rotary with Jeff and Nathan about a year ago, I use little three by five cards and we do that same exact exercise, you are, or I call it I see you as then, I now call it you are. I've kept every one of those when I've had to pair up with somebody because on the days I'm not feeling too good, it makes a huge, huge difference. So a couple last things I'm going to wrap up. Number one, I would love you to do, this is something I've started doing recently because I'd like to get a survey on this. I want you to write down my phone number, 206. Just put it in your, either in your phone or just on the notepad because I'm going to have you text something to me in the next few days when you can. 206-371-8309. And I'm kind of doing a survey on this because I'm getting some pretty good results. And what I would like you to do when you have time, 206-371-8309. When you have time, what's the biggest thing you're grateful for in your life? This, it can be one word, it can be a person, it can be anything, but I'm really getting some great answers and it's really neat to get that feedback and give it to people. So last thing, I mentioned gratitude sharing. I wanted to do a lot of crazy stuff in my life. One of them was skydiving. So I get these fraternity brothers Hey, why don't you set it up? You're the leader here. And I set it up, make a reservation for 10 people, 10 fraternity brothers, myself and nine of my friends. So we make it for Saturday. I've made the reservation about a week ahead of time. And on Monday, I get a call from a couple of them that cancel. And then on Tuesday, I get this from a couple. (coughs) I think I have a sore throat. Let me guess, you can't make it on Saturday, right? Yeah, I really wanted to go. A couple others bagged out on Thursday. So I get there on Saturday about 10 o'clock. I walk up proudly up to the counter. The guy goes, Issaquah skydiving. Can I help you? And I went, yeah. I have a reservation, uh, Brooke, for 10. And he looks behind me. He doesn't see anybody. And he goes, where are all your friends? I go, uh, I don't have any. <laughs> Nobody came except me. And so I don't ever use PowerPoint. I don't like PowerPoint, I like to look at people. I just have a thing about this clicker and all this stuff. But I do get to do churches occasionally with these huge screens. And I put up a picture of Connor and his baseball and Dana, my wife that passed away. But I show one of me skydiving, I'm like all scared and like like I'm gonna die. And it's kind of funny, because I thought I was a tough guy. But I went by myself, I get in my car, there's nobody to share it with. The guy goes, hey, nice jump, yeah, thanks. It's not the same when you don't share it. It makes such a difference. Service above self, as Rotary says. If you want to help yourself, help other people. Be grateful, never quit. And I will tell you the last thing. Gratitude, embracing gratitude can change your life. It can transform a life. 
And I feel I would not be standing here today speaking to you if it wasn't for gratitude. I think it can save a life too. It saved mine. It can save you guys too. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hey, thanks for that. You bet. Uh,